breaking news. Nikon Rumors has leaked the Z6 Mark III, and this is bad news for Sony and Canon. We'll tell you how it compares to the a7 IV and the R6 Mark II. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes amazing websites incredibly easy. Start at squarespace.com slash Tony, and in just a few clicks, you can have a beautiful portfolio, a website for your business, for your personal project, take appointments from clients, sell products, whatever you can imagine. It all starts at squarespace.com slash Tony. Get a 15-day free trial just to make sure you like it. No credit card required, none of that nonsense. And when you do love it, the coupon code Tony will save you 10%. Thank you, Squarespace. Our top and only story is the Nikon Z6 Mark III via NikonRumors.com. This is Nikon's sort of mid-level, entry-level professional camera. It's mid-level, but it's the entry-level for professional uses. The first two generations of the Z6 it came with kind of mixed reviews. The first one was definitely a miss. It just was not ready when Nikon launched it as the very first camera in their Nikon Z mirrorless system. Nikon made a huge leap in their technology. However, they're still far behind Canon, Sony, and Fuji. The Z6 regularly misfocused. If you try to shoot moving subjects at 11 frames per second, you'll find it impossible to keep up. You need to drop down to five frames per second for moving subjects if you're going to keep them in the frame. Another challenge for both the Z6 and the Z7 is auto white balance. It's the worst we've experienced in any modern camera. Metering on the Z6 and Z7 is primitive too. The Z6 Mark II was a big evolution of that. Though mechanically, electronically, it was much the same camera. The firmware updates that came along with just years of software development improved its functionality a lot. And the Z6 Mark III, I think, is going to adopt a lot of what makes the Z8 our camera of the year for 2023. And that's the ability to capture fast action, amazing autofocus, and a power that comes from Nikon being number three or lower. The competitiveness, the ability to not hold anything back because they're not worried about cannibalizing sales. Nikon's in a scary but enabling position. They have nothing to lose. So they throw everything into all of their recent cameras in an effort to steal some market share away from Canon and Sony. And the Nikon Z6 Mark III specs show a lot of this. So let's take a look at them. First of all, we have 20 frames per second raw. That's twice what the Sony a7 IV can do and 120 frames per second JPEG. But looking at some of their other specs, I think there's probably an asterisk next to this. I don't think that it can read out the sensor 120 times per second and thus true full width, high megapixel, 120 frames per second JPEG won't be possible. I suspect like the Z8 and Z9, they get to that with some reduction in capability. For example, maybe it's a quarter or half the number of megapixels that the full resolution images are, or maybe it's cropped in heavily. There needs to be some way for them to read out just part of the sensor in order to uh, get that high frame rate that I don't think is gonna be possible otherwise. I'll also say the 20 frames per second is probably not going to be available with a mechanical shutter. I don't think there's any full frame mechanical shutter that can do a full 20 frames per second. So this must be an electronic shutter. Whether or not that electronic shutter is really going to be practical and useful for sports and action where you might actually shoot 20 frames per second depends on the sensor, some details we don't know yet. If it's a stacked sensor like that in the Z8 and Z9 and A1, then it will be useful because it will read out really, really quickly. If it's not a stacked sensor, it might not be that useful. There are a lot of questions about the sensor still. The leaked specs don't include the number of megapixels. Now, the previous generations have had 24 megapixels, and I'm inclined to believe they'll just keep using 24 megapixels because that does differentiate it from the higher end Z8 and Z9 at 45 megapixels, and they do need to put some separation in there if they're going to introduce this at a significantly lower cost. I'm also wondering if they will do what they did in the Z8 and Z9 and leave out a mechanical shutter, a choice that I think is a mistake since I use flash a lot. I like high sync speeds. They had to really sacrifice that with the Z8 and Z9. They pitched not having a mechanical shutter like a feature, but to me, I've always seen it as a drawback. We also have to wonder what the buffer is. Giving you 120 frames per second 
with JPEGs can be amazing, but if the buffer fills up in less than a second, as it does with some really high-speed cameras, it's, it's not practical or useful in the real world. So subscribe, and when we review the released camera, I will answer all those questions and more for you. It's also supposed to offer eight-stop IBIS, which is sensor stabilization, which means no matter what lens you put on there, you'd be able to take low shutter speed shots handheld. Supposedly, it has the same IBIS mechanism that the Nikon ZF does. By the way, we have our hands on the ZF now. That review is coming, so subscribe to see that. And like the Z6 Mark II, it will have two memory card slots, one CF Express Type B and one SD card. So far, I think all of this makes total sense. They're trying to make a baby Z8 so they can offer oh, some of the amazing reputation that the Z8 has on a lower price point and bring more people to the system. But they also want it to be a more versatile camera, something you could use for stills and video, and for that reason they're giving it a flippy screen now. Nikon has not had a good full-frame camera with a flippy screen for video because they've sort of put that only in their lower range cameras and cameras like the Z8 here they have a tilting screen but it does not flip to the side well it flips out a little bit but it doesn't flip forward even though that doesn't seem like a, a huge drawback to me personally it seems like it adds a lot of versatility like I wanted to make it clear these are stills first cameras they don't want youtubers grabbing onto them to do their video productions even though something like 90% of camera buyers also plan to do video. So they are trying to address the broader market with the Z6 Mark III. They will give it a flippy screen that will flip forward. And so now maybe we can finally see if the camera is ready for vlogging. It will be about the same size and shape as the Nikon Z6 Mark II. I'm holding the Z7 here, but the bodies are exactly the same but about 30 to 40 grams heavier. So just a little bit heavier and just a little bit thicker because the flip screen takes up just a little more space than the previous generation's tilty screen did. The video specs here are pretty amazing and they really in particular blow away Sony. It will support 6K video at 60 frames per second in NRAW. This makes me believe it's a 24 megapixel sensor because I believe if it's NRAW, it's probably going to be a full readout and 6K video would be coming from a 24 megapixel sensor. So I think that all makes sense. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to offer that in just regular MP4 compressed format. So you would have to be using the Nikon RAW format, which is, it's heavy, it's big. And while it's versatile, you can do a lot of post-processing on it, uh, NRAW right now is limited to being used in DaVinci RAW. And so when I shoot wildlife video with the Z8 and Z9, I edit in Final Cut. So I end up having to bring them into DaVinci RAW, which I had to pay like 250 bucks in order to get that software, and then export it in a different format that I can edit in Final Cut, and it adds extra steps. It uses a massive amount of storage, and as a result, I hate using and raw for video, I would much rather just have regular compressed video. But I think you'll be able to get that option if you just drop down to 4K 60. And I think that 4K is full width, full readout, down sample, just like the video that you're watching now coming from my Canon R3, which just means you get extra sharp, extra useful 4K video. And you'll be able to output that in like 10-bit compressed or ProRes if you want to. There's also the option for 4K at 120 frames per second in NRAW but I think that's going to be cropped, probably a 1.5 times crop, probably a one-to-one -one readout from the middle of the sensor because it would need that in order to uh, do those high frame rates. Now, this is what leads me to believe that you're gonna have line skipping or cropping when shooting 120 frames per second JPEG. The specs say it cannot do 4K at 120 frames per second full width. The bottleneck there is almost certainly the sensor readout speeds. It cannot read the entire thing out 120 frames per second. That means the sensor readout speed must be longer than 1 120th of a second, which means 120 frames per second full readout would be impossible. I'm doing some extrapolation with my guesses here, but I actually feel pretty confident and I believe these specs. Let's take a minute and compare the Z6 Mark III specs as we know them now against the Canon R6 Mark II. Now, one big question I don't have answered for the Z6 Mark III is what the price is going to be. The current Z6 is like $1,600 if you buy it new. It was launched at $2,000. I think Nikon's going to launch this at $2,000. I wouldn't be shocked if they went up to $2,200 or $2,400. But 
being that they're in this third place, I think they're feeling really competitive. And I think they're willing to use a strategy that Sony used for many years, which is to underprice their bodies against the competition in order to draw people to the system, offer more features for less money, and you can help pull in some new customers who hopefully make up for your lost profits by buying lenses from you. The Nikon and the Canon have the same number of megapixels, but the Canon R6 Mark II will actually do 40 frames per second with its electronic shutter, twice what the Z6 will do. However, the Nikon offers the 120 frames per second sort of novel feature, which has some sort of asterisk next to it, but is still going to be an advantage. The Nikon will do 6K at 60 frames per second, raw, but again, I don't like the raw, and I'll probably end up using the 4K at 60 frames per second more often, which is exactly what the Canon R6 Mark II does. One thing we'll have to figure out is how it handles overheating, since my experience with the R6 Mark II is it overheats pretty quickly in 4K at 60 frames per second. The R6 Mark II has two SD card slots, so that's a little bit slower than the performance that you could get out of the Z6's CF Express Type-B and SD card, at least when writing to only one card. If you do need a backup, you'll be writing to both cards, in which case the SD card will still be a bottleneck and you'll see the same performance. But probably if you're shooting 6K at 60 frames per second raw, you're going to need to write to only that CF Express Type-B card, and that's something that the Canon R6 can't do with its SD cards. Now let's compare the Nikon Z6 Mark III to the Sony a7 IV. This is Sony's entry-level full-frame camera, but it's also intended for professionals. And it's priced at $2,500, but it does have a big advantage, and that is 34 megapixels. That means it's a better choice for things like wildlife, portraits, landscapes, but it gives up that high frames per second. It's still only 10 frames per second. That's pretty disappointing when you compare it against the Canon or the Nikon now at 20 frames per second. Now, if you don't shoot sports or action, that number means absolutely nothing to you, and you'll probably get better results with the Sony. But if you do sometimes shoot sports or a dog playing or even like a kid running for family portraits, you might sometimes appreciate that higher frames per second. The Nikon will also beat the Sony in video. The Sony can do 4K at 60 frames per second, but it's with a 1.5 times crop. And that's pretty disappointing. That means if you're a mixed stills and video shooter, you're going to have to either just zoom back when you start shooting video or change to a completely different lens. It also means you're not going to get the shallow depth of field or the low light capabilities that you could get with your big full frame camera. Because after all, whenever you're shooting 4K60, you suddenly have an APS-C camera. You can live with it. You can work around it. But for me, as somebody who films in 4K60 all the time, I insist on full width 4K60. The Nikon gives me that and the Sony doesn't. So, so far, the Nikon is looking really good. Now, the Sony has two symmetric cards. They're both CF Express Type-A, which can also take an SD card, and that means you can use two CF Express Type-A cards in there in situations where you're shooting action, and you might want to reduce the amount of buffering that you get. But CF Express Type-A is generally twice the cost and half the performance of CF, CF Express Type-B. So the Nikon has asymmetric cards where one is slower than the other and would cause bottlenecks if you shoot raw to both cards. But the CF Express Type-B card you get is going to be cheaper and faster. So I, I don't know. I think the Sony is actually the better configuration if you're shooting raw to both cards. But if you are willing to shoot raw to one, JPEG to the other, or if you don't care about having a backup, I think the Nikon is the better configuration. Nikon Rumors is also saying that there were two Nikon cameras registered, and we've only accounted for one. So what is the other one? And they point out that there are some cameras that are due. Like when Nikon launched the Z6 and the Z6 Mark II, they did it alongside the Z7. And we haven't seen any rumors about Nikon's higher megapixel version of that camera, and it certainly does need a refresh, because this in particular, had really slow autofocus, really slow sensor readout, but maybe they don't need the Z7 anymore because maybe the Z8 line is good enough and they would be too close in price to bother making two separate high megapixel cameras. Another option would be the Z50 Mark II, which is uh, one of their higher end APS-C cameras, or maybe it's time to update the Nikon Z5. The Nikon Z5 is one of my favorite cameras in their lineup because it's the entry level full frame camera. And I, I really want to see more inexpensive full frame cameras. I don't like that we push first time buyers at lower price points to APS-C because if they do want to upgrade, they have to change their lenses. And there's so much confusion about APS-C versus full frame lenses. So I'm glad Nikon has the Z5, but when we tested it, the autofocus was 
pretty flaky and I didn't love it. And as a result, I would love to see that updated with Nikon's much improved autofocus system that we've tested in the Z8 that won the Z8, the camera of the year. In the comments down below, let me know what you think. Are these specs great? Would you buy it at $2,000 or would you buy it at $2,500? If it's true, are any of you tempted to switch from Canon or Sony or maybe Olympus or Panasonic? Let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to subscribe to see the full review as soon as that camera is available. And for all your website needs, don't go to social media. Go to squarespace.com slash Tony where you can set up a beautiful website that you have complete control over. No ads on there. You can choose the fonts, the colors. You update it as frequently as you want. Squarespace.com slash Tony is where it all begins. You get a completely free trial. No credit card, just browse through. Make your work and yourself look beautiful on the internet. And after you love it, the coupon code Tony will get you 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. Bye.